Welcome to Unbecoming. On today's episode, I'm interviewing a good friend of mine, Justin Donald, who has been called the investment world's new Warren Buffett. If you are ready to redefine wealth and then generate some more, or just ready to make better decisions with the money that you do have, this episode is for you. Most people think that success is about becoming something or someone different. That one day, after a lifetime of hard work, hustling, and burning out, you become successful. Well, I believe that the secret to success is found in unbecoming, a practice of releasing the judgments, beliefs, and past conditioning holding you back from living a more meaningful life. And as a coach, speaker, and marketing strategist to entrepreneurs all over the world, there's a one thing I know for sure. We need more honest, vulnerable conversations about what it really takes to build a successful business and life outside the box. Welcome to the Unbecoming Podcast, and I'm your host, Phoebe Morochek. I'll be here every Tuesday with a conversation you won't want to miss. You can find the show notes from today and all past episodes, as well as free resources, access to our growing international community, and behind-the-scenes footage at unbecomingpodcast.com. Thanks again for being here. Now let's jump into today's conversation. You ready? Let's do this. Hello, hello, and welcome back to another week of Unbecoming. My name is Phoebe Morochek, and if you are new to the show, welcome. This is the perfect place for you to start. If you are a loyal listener, welcome back. Thank you again for showing up every week with me. I am really excited for today's episode because at the beginning of 2021, I declared this the year of financial literacy for myself and generating wealth. Now, then I found out my friend Justin Donald was coming out with this book. I started reading it. The more I got into it, the further I got, I realized that there might just be other people out there like me who want to get a grip on their finances, who want to not just generate more, but make better decisions with the money that they have. Now, I am a big proponent and advocate for women feeling empowered around their finances, We talk a lot about that in this episode. Now, if you don't know my background, I've had a lot of different jobs, worked in a lot of different fields. And one of those was several years ago, I worked in Cambodia at a microfinance bank. Now, I it wasn't until that moment or that time that I realized the connection between poverty and female economic empowerment. Now, what that means, statistically speaking, as it relates to microfinancing is that When women control the finances, when women make the money, they make better decisions for their family. They make better decisions for their kids as far as education and health, clean water. And it also helps the community grow even more and get more loans. So with that said, bringing it into present day where I am now, I am so empowered around my finances and will continue to grow that way, especially after this book. Also, I am motivated to help other women like me feel better, feel like they belong in the room and have a better understanding of their finances. Now, if you're like me, you probably have read the books, you've probably done the courses, been in undergrad or your master's degree like I was taking all of these personal finance classes or corporate finance and trying to get a grip on what was happening in the world. How do we make money and make better decisions with that money? However, as it's going out one year, I realized that I was hiring people to do some of the work that I didn't understand. Yet, I don't want to, just like it is in business or in our lives, why are we going to pay people to do things that we don't necessarily understand? I want to understand it so I know where my money is going. That is why this conversation today is so important because Justin breaks it down for us in ways that we can understand, ways that feel manageable. And what I love about his approach so much is that he's not just making money for money's sake, right? He's making money so that he can buy back his time so he can do what he wants with his money and spend time with the people he wants to spend time with. I'm up for that. I'm up for that kind of lifestyle. Now, before I read his bio, I did want to say that I invited Justin to stay after the interview just for a couple minutes, and he very kindly agreed. And I just asked him some things that we didn't get to fit in on the interview, things like what is the most common piece of advice that he gives his top paying clients? These are people that pay him 
$250,000 a year plus. Also, what is the most costly, simple, yeah, most costly um, mistake that people make that he sees that we can easily fix? And then on the business front, what are what is the number one tip, tool, or resource or strategy that he has used in his business in the last three to five years that has had the most significant impact on the growth of his business? That and a couple other questions. And you can find that for free. I want to make sure I mention that. It's free at www.unbecomingpodcast.com forward slash 164. Again, unbecomingpodcast.com forward slash 164. And you get access to all of this information things that people pay him a lot of money to know. So let me go ahead and dive in to his bio. Entrepreneur Magazine calls Justin Donald the Warren Buffett of lifestyle investing. He's a master of low risk cash flow investing, specializing in simplifying complex financial strategies, structuring deals, and disciplined investment systems that consistently produce profitable results. His ethos is to create wealth without creating a job. Now, if you don't know what any of that stuff means, totally fine. If you do, great. If you don't and you're kind of like me and you're like, wow, that was a lot of words, don't worry. He breaks it all down. Now, in the span of 21 months and before his 40th birthday, Justin's investments drove enough passive income for both he and his beautiful, lovely, kind wife, Jennifer, to leave their jobs. Following his simple investment system and 10 commandments of lifestyle investing, Justin negotiated deals with over 100 companies multiplied his net worth to over eight figures, and then maintained a family-centric lifestyle in less than two years. And then just two years after that, he doubled his net worth again. So now he consults and advises entrepreneurs and executives on lifestyle investing. He is the author of his new book called The Lifestyle Investor, The Ten Commandments of Cash Flow Investing for Passive Income and Financial Freedom. And then he's the host of his new podcast, The Lifestyle Investor. Both feature his lessons and proven investment system that consistently produces repeatable results. Now, there are a lot of accolades that I could read to you, but I'm going to scroll to the bottom and just read you some of the things that I find the most important, the most interesting. He is a member of Tiger 21 and a board member of the Front Row Foundation. He and Jennifer contribute to various causes privately and through their church, fighting cancer, building clean water wells in third world countries and other humanitarian efforts. Additionally, they sponsor multiple children through Compassion International. They are based here in Austin, Texas, and love adventure-based international travel with their beloved daughter. So there is a lot there. There's a lot to get into. I can't wait for you to hear this episode. And I just want to remind you, all the links, all the resources, if you want to buy his book, if you want to learn more about him, his podcast, all of that, you can find it www.unbecomingpodcast.com forward slash 164. And now before we jump into the episode, I do want to say that Justin is a friend of mine. He is somebody who I admire, I look up to, and I also really value in my life. I wouldn't be bringing him on here if I didn't. And so I really hope that you see his heart, you see how kind he is, how much he really wants this. And I also think it's worth noting, I don't know if we mentioned it in the interview, but all of his proceeds are going to charity for his book, which speaks volumes about the kind of person he is and his wife, Jennifer, that they are making this available for you to learn so that you can get a grip on your finances. So if this is the year, if you're like me and you are ready to take 2021 on with a new burst of information and understanding of our finances, then you're going to love this episode. I can't wait for you to hear this wonderful episode with my good friend, Justin Donald. All right, Justin, I am so excited to have you on the show. This has been a long time coming. So thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to have you. Well, it's a pleasure and I'm thrilled to be here. I mean, just to be able to hang out and have an excuse to get some quality time, I think is great. So uh, more than anything, I'm, I'm just excited for what you and I get a chance to talk about. Me too. This is what we were just saying before we hit record, that this is like my selfishly my conversations that I want to be having anyway. So it's so nice to be able to see you, even though we're in the same city and um, just spend some time. So I want to start off by asking you when you are in a social setting, how do you introduce yourself? I've already kind of read your bio. People know a little bit more about your background, but can you tell me more about how you would introduce yourself? 
You know, that's a great question. You know, Phoebe, that it, it's evolved um, and, and it kind of depends on the circumstances. Uh, so sometimes I might just say I'm an investor. Other times I might say I'm a real estate investor. Sometimes I may say I'm a lifestyle investor. I mean, technically what I am is a lifestyle investor because I invest in a way uh, that produces cash flow so I can live my life. And so no one knows really what a lifestyle investor is because I coined the term. So it, it adds kind of like a nice like, oh, what, what's a lifestyle investor? Uh, and so I can kind of explain, you know, the, the whole, you know, my whole ethos and, and just I love the idea of living life on purpose because it's not about making money. It's about being intentional with where I spend my time and with whom I spend my time. Yeah, I and what I'll say to that is what I know about you and what I've learned about you since getting to know you a little bit better has been just your emphasis on relationships. We're going to talk a lot about investing kind of as it flows as we go along the show. But I do want to say um, you care a lot about relationships. You're a relationships guy. That's how I have experienced you as a friend. You're just really intentional about where you spend your time. Is that something that you are intentional about or is that something that comes really natural to you? Yeah. So certainly I'm intentional about it. There are probably aspects that come naturally, but there are probably aspects that I observed over the years from my mom who, you know, growing up is just a phenomenal conversationalist, is a phenomenal relationship, uh, you know, just I want to call her an expert, a relationship expert, if there is even such a thing, you know, but She's just great with people. And I learned that and I modeled that. And then I had mentors along the way that were great with people. So I, whether it was intentional or whether I, you know, picked it up subconsciously, it happened. But also part of it was I wanted to be around people that care about people. And Mm. I just, I love just a good quality relationship, a good quality conversation. My wife and I are so intentional about this that we have a planning day every year where we set up the for, for the, the whole next year, which we're about to have here in, in December to set up all of 2021, where we figure out who are the couples that we want to be intentional and spend time with, who are the one-on-one people like for me and my network that are important to me. And then she has the same for the people that are important to her because couples don't always, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, you, you've got the, you, you've got a couple here, a couple here, that doesn't mean that all four are going to enjoy one another's time. And so <laughs> finding couples where everyone enjoys each other's time, that, that's unique. And so we, we cherish those relationships. And, and when it's not that, we still want to be intentional with those people and make sure that we're maintaining those as well. So instead of just letting it happen and seeing what happens, we want to say, hey, let's be proactive and schedule some dates with these people. And what, well, first of all, let me say, what if it's not a couple? I'm going to raise my hand because... If that is the case, how do you create time for, or does that happen often when you say, oh, this is somebody that I want to see, and maybe it's not somebody that she wants, you know, how do you kind of navigate that scenario? Yeah. So we have our couples that we all hang out with, but I have a top 10 list and my top 10 relationships that are my priority, I spend time with and I schedule those. And, and those will be just like a me and them. In fact, we share a mutual mm-hmm. friend and, and, you know, he's one of those people that uh, he's also single. And uh, I I just love spending time with them. And so it's important to me that regardless if they're in a relationship or not, um, I just want to continue fostering our relationship and growing uh, because people people change over time. And I want to grow with people, not Mm -hmm. apart from people. And what is your filter through which you determine who is on that top 10 list? Oh, so my top 10 list changes every year. It's, it's really interesting. So I have some people that have stood the test of time where, you know, year in and year out, they're on that list. Uh, and, and sometimes that's like my closest friends, childhood friends to family members. And other times it's new people that just came into my life, but we just hit it off so well. And so you know, maybe I haven't known them as long as I've known other people, but I just feel like I want, I I have this like compelling urge to get to know them better. Uh, And Mm -hmm. so, you know, this year I have uh, two new relationships that uh, are are exactly that two friendships that really blossomed uh, one of them this year and one of them over the last two years and has really shifted who and where I'm spending my time. 
Mm, I love it. So when you, I want to shift kind of, you talked about your mom and I want to learn more about who you were in order to get where we are today. So what did you want to be when you grew up? What was your childhood dream? Well, I always wanted to be in the investment game in some way, shape or form. Uh, so when I was really young, I thought that I would be either an entrepreneur owning businesses or I would be a stockbroker. I went through some different phases um, and really it was one of those two camps. It was either in the financial services, but not traditional financial services uh, or in entrepreneurship. And, and so it ended up being a little bit of both along the way. And it's interesting because the skills that I learned from each side have really complemented the other side. Uh, because they're, it's just a big bridge that needs to be gapped. Um, mm -hmm. Most entrepreneurs uh, have had so much success with running their business or successful entrepreneurs have that they think they're just going to be successful in everything they do. And then they fall on their face really hard in finances <laughs> and investing because it's not that easy. And then the same thing, you've got investors that are really successful, but then when they go try and run a business, they fall on their face. So it, it's a tough bridge to gap, but I have just had a passion for both my mm -hmm. whole life. You know, one of the things in my uh, high school yearbook, uh, when you got to put in, I don't know if you got to do this, but you got to say, you know, what you were going to be when, when you grew up or what you, what you aspired for. And mine was to be a business owner. Huh. And what about when you were like a kid kid? Like, cause I don't know any, you know, six or seven year olds that are being asked and they're like, I want to be an investor. <laughs> so like, what was that dream? Like pre high school, did you have uh, anything crazy? Pre high school is probably just an athlete. You know, I wanted okay. to, I wanted to play sports, some sport. I played a lot of sports, and you know, I ha I still have a love for sports and a love for competition. Yeah. So you know, I mean, I remember phases where I was like, "Ooh, I could be a fireman," but that was really short lived. Once I found out that you know, <laughs> you go into burning buildings. But at first, it sounded cool. Like yeah. when I saw them, uh, you know, I had a phase where I wanted to be a superhero. Yeah. Uh, so you know, that one. <laughs> Uh, you know, there, there's different ways to be a superhero than what I had envisioned as a kid. Yeah. Um, but, you know, probably pro athlete would be the main thing. Any um, sport in particular? Well, I, I mean, I played every sport in an organized yeah. league at some point in my life, except football, because my mom wouldn't let me. Uh, volleyball is, is a true passion and favorite. And, uh, I played a lot of soccer and, and baseball, but at the time of soccer, I knew I wasn't really going to go anywhere, at least in the U S mm. um, just they're, they're, you know, it's, it's not like it is in Europe and other places around the world. And, uh, I guess I just wasn't good enough at, uh, at baseball or volleyball. So, you know, <laughs> but you know now some... you're, a, you're like a pro on the Austin <laughs> volleyball courts. I've heard. Uh, I love to play, you know, here. So what happened for me is it came down to a point of I needed to choose. Am I going to pursue sports or am I going to church like pursue making money? And so even at high school, I made that decision where I stopped sports because I found a really lucrative opportunity and I started my own business and I pursued that because that was to me the higher calling. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and I'm curious what pieces of the pro athlete lifestyle or any of the things that you saw in high school, right? To be a business owner. I mean, obviously that came true, but what are the pieces that you feel like have that you've actually achieved in present day? Um, in, in terms of what, uh, here, clarify that. I want to make sure I'm answering this. Uh, yeah. So properly. when you like, what pieces of being an athlete did you see and say, I want that? And how has that manifested into your current day or helped you or, you know, helped us help you aspire to be kind of where you are now? Yeah. So to me, when I look at an athlete, I look at the best of the best. You know, I'm, I'm looking at someone or, or people, a group of people that have literally outperformed, you know, 99% of the world uh, in the thing that they're doing. And so that was appealing besides just the love for competition and athletics. I mean, it was really fun more than anything else. I love, uh, I love achievement. I love to learn. I love, um, the work ethic involved in getting good at something. Mm -hmm. I love the discipline. And so it's all those things that helped me excel in athletics that then helped me excel in what I'm doing today. But, you know, to me, it was really just kind of finding a way to be the best at your craft 
if I were going to go into sports, that's what I'd want to do. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I was built that way. I don't know if I had pursued athletics, if I even would have been able to get there. I probably would not have. Uh, so I'm glad that I picked the other route. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, even today, I still love sports and athletics and, you know, I'll watch sports. I'll play sports. Uh, it's just so fun to me. Yeah, it's funny. I had a moment. Um, so I played soccer in college. And so I had this moment when I quit and I jumped right into a multi-level marketing company, which because I, I saw, well, I saw all the skills required in athletics in order to bridge that and jump into business. And it was these things that were mirrored so closely that no one had really I don't know, maybe they hadn't considered or just talked to me about. I And so I changed my major to business and got really involved and invested in that. But it's interesting that you kind of, it sounds like you had a similar skill set, a similar desire, and then just, ma- which made the jump potentially more easy. Would you say that's correct? Yeah. So I, I do think it was an easy transition. It doesn't mean that it was easy, but I think it was easier than what it probably would have been because yeah. I had developed a lot of those skills from playing sports. I had developed a lot of uh, just routine and conditioning and mindset and all those, I think, really uh, transition well into other areas of life. And so you'll see a lot of athletes. I mean, obviously, a lot of athletes you know, aren't great with their money, lose all their money. Mm. But you still also see a lot of athletes that go on to do great things in other industries because of that skill set. And it's not just the skill set, it's the mindset, it's the discipline, it's the persistence, it's the team dynamics, it's all these different things um, that I think, you know, really help. And I also think that, you know, maybe one of the greatest gifts that I have is that I have this insatiable desire to learn everything. So Mm. I'm just, I just always want to learn. I want to be a student. I'm a lifelong, eternal student, and it just doesn't ever get old to me. I just want to keep learning. I want to meet new people and learn more about them. I want to learn new subjects. I want to learn. I just want to master everything. What's your zodiac sign? Uh, Cancer. Oh, okay. I was going to say, that language sounds like a Gemini, which is what I am, so... Well, um, I am one day, well, let's, let's see, two, day, two days off from a Gemini, but I'm pretty sure based on uh, everything I've seen, I, I <laughs> fall in the, uh, the cancer camp, but yep. uh, I'm pretty close to that Gemini. So maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe we'll see. Um, okay. So, and then when growing up, were your parents, were there, or what expectations or what was like the family vision of success for you? What did people, what did your, either your parents or, you know, your close relationships talk about as like, you know, doctors, lawyers, that's usually what we hear about. But was there that vision of what was the vision of success for you guys? Well, luckily for me, and this is a total testament to my parents, I never felt any pressure from them or any uh, status or any level or measurement or anything. Like I never even considered that that's what I could do or should do. Or if I wanted to be successful, I should choose from one of those things. They just really said, what do you want to do? And we'll love you no matter what you do. I mean, so that they were just really great in that. Um, You know, my parents are, are very working class, very blue collar. Uh, my mom worked at, uh, at the church we attended for most of my life, um, you know, making about twenty-seven to thirty thousand dollars in salary per year. Uh, even when she retired, I think her the most she ever made was was thirty thousand dollars. And then my dad, you know, did some some form of sales, whether it was car sales, appliance sales, uh, and so he was more in the forty thousand dollar range. And so, um, and, and for a lot of that time growing up, my mom wasn't working even, you know, especially when I was younger. So. We were, you know, very much in, and I'm giving you today's numbers, so it, it you know, it could have been a little bit less, um, but you know, that's kind of what I grew up with. I didn't necessarily know a lot of attorneys or doctors or you know anyone like that. There were certainly you know people I knew of or I had friends whose parents were, but um, I just uh, I just feel like my parents equipped me because they said, "Do what you want to do," and uh, they loved me real well through it. You know, especially when I tried things that didn't work or when I wasn't good at things uh, at the beginning. And are you an only child? I have a younger brother, three years younger. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so how do you, 
dream of something, you know, being, you wanted to be a business owner. How do you have that dream when you don't necessarily see it modeled? You know, that's, that's interesting. I actually think that a lot of it came from, uh, so number one, I had, uh, one friend, a really good friend whose dad owned a computer, uh, software company. So I at least had exposure to this idea of being a business owner. Uh, I also loved movies and books. And so I, I watched tons of movies, read tons of books. So I think I had exposure that way as well. And I started reading Robert Kiyosaki's books very early uh, and, and specifically Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I mean, I read that very early in my life. And so that had some sort of impact probably as well, uh, even maybe before I realized it. You know, when I was older, I got into them again and and you know, even when I first started, you know, running a business like that, that was something I thought of and I reread them and stuff made so much more sense. But I, I do think that even back then when I didn't know how I was going to do it, it was still in the back of my mind. I, I was still thinking of that. And thinking I'm going to own a business. I just don't know what it is or I have this passion how do I turn that? Because it doesn't sound like it was this like real insatiable passion for this one specific thing. It was more the business. How do I create a business? And, you know, I don't know what it's going to be about. Yeah, it, it was the challenge to me. Mm. It's like achieving something I had never done, achieving something no one in my family had ever done. Uh, so, so that was cool. It was just more about that experience than what the business was. I had no clue what I was going to do. Uh, and that really didn't matter to me. And also kind of being in the place, I mean, part of what I thought about is how can I be in, how can I use my strengths with working with people and, and, you know, having good relationships with people? How can I do some form of profession that supports those or embraces those. And so, you know, starting a company really does do that because you develop really close relationships, especially as you're bringing people on, especially as you're brand new and startup phase and, and all that. And so to me, the, my, my, the values that are, high, that, that are like my highest values are really like relation, strong quality relationships with people. So having a business really supported those things and allowed me to fine tune my skills of working with people mm -hmm. and being in relationship with people. So I really think it was a nice compliment. Yeah. And so if you were going to describe your, whenever you started, so actually bring me to your first job or your first business encounter. What was that like? So when I was in seventh grade, I asked my mom for some money and she said, no, if you want money, you need to get a job. And I'm like, I'm only in seventh grade. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to give me money. And I had an allowance. I did stuff around that. But I, I wanted real money, you know. And she said, get a job. So I said, all right. And there weren't a lot of people hiring seventh graders. <laughs> but uh, I found a company that uh, would allow me to sell newspaper subscriptions door to door. And so I was young. And I went on this crew with these kids. And this guy took them out and dropped them off in neighborhoods. Probably sounds crazy today, but, uh, you know, I, I knocked on doors and uh, at the beginning, didn't do a good job at my job because I didn't sell newspaper subscriptions. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do well. People said no. I didn't know what to say. I just went from home to home with a whole bunch of no's. Uh, and I was really, really bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> that just brings me to my Mary Kay days when I would like go into Walmart and just talk to third. I had to get 30 names and numbers and I would not leave. And, and it was so uncomfortable. <laughs> and you just walk up to people and you're like, Wah. you know, I don't even know what to say. You just are so put on the spot, but you're 12. <laughs> yeah. I was eight or 19. So at 12 years old, but then, then it started to develop, right? Because you started another job and you started working and bringing people on and whatnot, right? Well, so what ended up happening is I can't stand not being good at something. Hmm. So I will do whatever it takes in terms of time and effort and just work, uh, just discipline, whatever it takes, I will do it to figure it out. And then once I figured it out, I'll say, I don't want to do this anymore, but mm -hmm. I had to figure it out before I said, before I quit. Uh, or I really like this now that I'm good at it. 
And mm-hmm. so with the newspaper subscriptions, I actually got good at it. It took some time. I was really, you know, kind of an awkward kid, uncomfortable around, you know, people, adults. I, you know, I, the way I show up today is nothing like I showed up then. Uh, I still love people, but I was very shy. So this was a job that got me way out of my comfort zone and talking to adults, you know, that's intimidating as a seventh grader. And, uh, and so with time, you know, this, this company didn't even have scripts. So I eventually came up with my own script that ended up working, started taking off. I started getting the best results in the group. And really it was, I just found a language that made sense. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to handle objections and I learned to not take no personally. And so I just worked hard. I worked probably harder than anyone else. And uh, the results started improving. And then eventually I built my own business there where I took other kids and even people my age. I shouldn't even say kids. I mean, you know, at, at a certain point I was bringing, you know, young adults around on crews doing the same thing and they were on, on my crew. So I stopped going door to door selling and I had a team that would sell and I would make a, a, a percentage of each of their sales. That's awesome. And just even to know that at, I mean, 12, starting at 12 years old, that is just absolutely insane. (laughs) And were your parents like, what is going on? What is happening? (laughs) Or were they like, yep, we knew. So it got real interesting because I don't think my parents thought I would do well with it, but they liked the fact that I was willing to work. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and by the way, that's a job where you get paid a hundred percent commission. So like I was working for a while, not making any money because I was horrible. And then once I got good, I started making really good money though. And, uh, and so I did this all through high school. Uh, and, and really I, it got to a point where even as a, a freshman in high school, I was bringing home $500 checks working three or four nights a week for four, maybe five hours a night. I mean, it, it was pretty crazy. I was making a lot more than any of my friends and my friends were like, what are you doing? You know, can you teach me? So then I just, I started hiring my friends and I started teaching them my scripts and laminating these clipboards and, you know, using all my, my language that I had created that ended up working for me and just giving it out to everyone. That is so awesome. (laughs) And so now, okay, now I have read, I have to say, I haven't finished it, but I've read most of your book and you paint such a vivid picture of what your present day looks like just on a day-to-day basis. Can you share a little bit more about what today looks like for you on a, you know, from start to finish, you know, rough estimate of like what a week, a day in in your week looks like? Sure. I mean, today's not a typical day because I recorded day four of my audio book. So, you know, (laughs) I I had uh, some some, uh, obligations that I don't don't always have, but uh, I am done with that. I also on Thursdays run my investors club call. So I have, you know, everyone in my network that invests in the different deals that I do, you know, I I run that, but um, I get up early. I like, I always just wake up early and I get some journaling time in, I get some reading time in, I think for a bit. When my family gets up, I hang out with them, do breakfast with them. Uh, Then I go to the gym when my daughter goes to school because I really want to make sure I'm maxing out my quality time with her. Since uh, she's gone for, you know, eight hours a day, seven and a half hours a day, whatever it is, um, that time, there isn't much time. So I want to make sure I'm soaking it up. And, uh, and then it depends on the day of the week. You know, I, I, even though I don't technically have to work, I still love to work. I love to work on the things that I'm excited about. So uh, there are companies that I invest in and mentor and I, and, and, you know, I enjoy that. I, I advise and so that's fun with me. I've got clients that I teach how to invest. And for a period of time, I was just an investor. So I, I was a practitioner, right? Not, a, not an educator. Mm. And, uh, and I enjoyed that. But it's way more fulfilling to teach people how to do it. Because when you, achieve, when you work hard to achieve financial freedom, that's an amazing experience. It's exhilarating. But once it's done, it's done. Mm. You know, so it's not like it gets that much sweeter. So the sweetness comes from helping other people accomplish it. So mm. depending on the day of the week, I'll, I'll group uh, some of my calls in, you know, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I like to do most of my work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and Mondays and Fridays, I like to keep open. Uh, fr- Mondays, I like to do a lot of thinking, planning, strategizing. And this doesn't even have to be business. This is just life. 
uh, dreams, you know, wh whatever it might be that, you know, helps me uh, find inspiration for the week. And then Fridays, I like to spend time with family, friends. My wife and I often do a date day rather than a date night where uh, our energy is really a lot higher. And, uh, and so that's a lot of fun. And then in the evenings, we do a family dinner generally at five, uh, which may sound early to <laughs> many people, especially those of you that don't have kids or are single. Uh, I do remember the days of 7, 8, 9 p.m. dinners, but uh, those are <laughs> long gone. And so we start early so that we get as much time as we can as a family. And uh, I hang out with my daughter till we put her down. And then my wife and I get some quality time after that. Uh, and so we try to put her down early so that, that uh, my wife and I can really connect uh, the majority of days a week. And that's it. You know, I do some self-care on Fridays with uh, massage or chiropractic adjustment. Uh, I work out each day. I like to play sports on the weekends. And, uh, you know, really, I, I try not to do any work on the weekends uh, or in the evenings. And, uh, and often I will not do work on a Friday uh, or I'll do an extended weekend of, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is work. And then Friday through Monday is time off and mm. maybe travel uh, a little bit less travel this year than what we've done in the past. But we've actually still done a pretty good amount of travel. I think we've, you know, we, since March and COVID began, I think we've still clocked somewhere between 20 and 30 flights. So, mm. wow. Well, what I love so much about hearing that I I think a lot of people or that I know, right. I, I see them and I just want to know what a day in their life looks like. And I want to know what would you do if you had more time? And I know that in reading your book, you talk about your commandments and one of the, the first one is lifestyle first. And it's really refreshing to see somebody who is actually living that. So when you say lifestyle first, can you talk to us about what, what does that exactly mean for you? Great question. And there's, the, there's a reason it's the first commandment. And it's because I really think that people should set up, or at least for me, the value is I want to set up my life in a way that I can choose what I do, that mm -hmm. I'm not a slave to anyone. I'm not a slave to any business that I own. I'm not a slave as an employee to someone else's business, that I can truly do life on my terms, uh, a life by my design, not just going through life reacting to what is happening and responding. I want to proactively live. And so I want to live in a way that focuses on that lifestyle. Where are my values? I want to live life according to those values every day. So part of it was to escape a job or a business that, you know, at one point I had the golden handcuffs. I made really good money. Uh, and, and, because of that, it was hard to leave because there's the unknown and that amount of income sustains the lifestyle that I'm accustomed to, even though I lived well beneath my means. Uh, it, you know, it's, that's still a daunting thing, but I wanted to do it on my terms. I didn't want to have to work. I wanted to get to work. And then from the standpoint of investing, I didn't want to make investments that took more time. My goal was to buy my time back. Mm -hmm. So I want investments that don't require my time. And I want to create cash flow in a way where all my expenses, all my lifestyle is covered. And that way I can choose where I want to spend my time and who I want to spend my time with. And I get to live inside my passions, not wonder what it would be like to do it. So this is what... This is the point where I had told you before we started recording that I was wondering where our paths intersect. And it was this path of lifestyle first and that we have this life. And if I've learned anything in the last year, right, it is create a life that you love because it's fragile and protect it and enjoy it. And so this is where our paths intersect. And I really love your approach to it because even reading in your book, it's so clear what, your, what you value and how you've set up your life to demonstrate that and to reflect the things and the people that you really love and care about. And so I do want to go back to one thing that you said, because you were talking about having this kind of cushy job, golden handcuffs, all of that. And I think people could probably relate to that, whether or not you're making tons of money or you're just in a job where it's stable and it feels really secure, which in a world like this right now, we are like clinging to any form of security right now. So how do you leave 
like what was you hear about a lot of people that talk about you know their job was terrible or they got sick and it was like this turning point moment but if you have i find the people that are harder to influence or impact or get on board with entrepreneurship or you know maybe for you investing are the people who life is just it's fine it's good you know there's if they didn't make any changes it would still be okay so what was that leap like for you to move from a steady, secure job into this next season of your life? Yeah, I think it's a, a great point. You know, you, you said people get kind of complacent with good. And Jim Collins talks about how good is the enemy of great. And I, I think that that's so true. And really, I mean, for you, you had this wonderful, you know, if we can take a bad situation and call it a wonderful wake up call on how to live intentionally the way that you want to on your terms moving forward, most people don't have that. And so they just go through life as is. And uh, I remember when I was, you know, th this is the story of many entrepreneurs. You, you transition from working for someone to working for yourself because you want freedom and autonomy and, you know, hopefully more income as well. And, what ends up happening is you become the slave to the job that you built that was supposed to give you all those things. And so, you know, the, the kind of two camps that I see, there's the camp of people that work for someone else and they're kind of tied into uh, normal or regular or routine, or this is just the way it is. I'm afraid to leave because this is safe and secure and predictable. And I know I'm going to earn what I need to earn, even though you could lose your job tomorrow. Uh, but it doesn't feel that way, right? And then you've got your entrepreneurs that have this business and uh, maybe their lifestyle has increased and it seems like they're in a better situation, which they probably are, or maybe it depends on the situation. If you have a thriving business, maybe you are. If you have a, a you know really floundering business, you may not be. Um, but you often, I see uh, people just that their income rises as their business rises. And so you create an even bigger, you know, treadmill that you're on like mm -hmm. this, you know, the, the hamster wheel, if you will. So those are kind of the two camps. And then I also see people that have, you know, a big exit. They're sitting on a lot of cash, don't know what to do. They try to invest, they start losing money and they're like, oh no, I might lose everything. You know, so th those to me are kind of like your three camps of people, uh, you know, at least that I, I run into. And, and I do think it's nerve wracking to move on from the thing that you know for comfort and security's sake. But there's also something thrilling about it as well. You know, Tony Robbins actually talks about one of the, um, there, there's a, a bad combination of um, needs, all right? Every, every human has these basic needs, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And Tony Robbins has his own hierarchy of needs. And, and one of the combinations, uh, and I'm not going to get into too much detail, but having too much security and safety um, can actually uh, create less joy and happiness. Like one of the things that people need in their life is variety, change, new. Uh, and so I think that when you get too much into being tied into something, it kind of leeches away some of the joy and passion that could exist in life. This is just a, you know, a thought. It's something I've experienced. It's something I've seen in other people. Uh, so part of it is learning to be comfortable with the unknown. And then part of it is making a good game plan. I mean, there are ways to invest money to create cash flow that equals at least what it costs to live before you would ever do that. Uh, and so for me, that's what I did before I stepped away. What I made sure is that I had my bare minimum expenses covered. And then once I got those done, I could have stepped away, but I decided to, uh, you know, get a little bit more in, in income coming in on cash flow that covered my lifestyle. So that way, if I transitioned, nothing changed. Ironically, though, I realized I didn't have to wait that long. I thought I did, but I didn't because the moment I had more time, I started earning more income because I had time to think about what it is I wanted to do or ways to earn more income. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really funny. So I was like, holy cow, I didn't even need to do all this elaborate planning. Now, that being said, I think the plan and having a good you know, plan B or exit strategy is really important. I'm not advising against it. But if you are a person that can embrace that uncertainty uh, comfortably and you have 
you believe in your ability to be able to manufacture those type of results, I think you can do it without waiting to have those expenses covered. So those are just a couple of different ways to do it.